Welcome back to Rafting Magazine, and on today's show we have the spectacular International River Guide, Messa Rasmussen, on, and she's going to be joining us to talk about paddling abroad and uh, some ideas about being self-taught as a river guide. So before we get into it, uh, please make sure you guys are liked and subscribed, and if you have any comments or questions for Messa or for us, please drop those down below. And uh, so let's start getting into it. Uh, Messa, tell us about yourself and if you could, you know, who are you, what are you all about, and a little bit more about what you do. Okay. Well, okay, so I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, or more so Sandy, a little town below the Sea Resort. And I started whitewater guiding when it was 2012, so it happened to be the low water year after the high water year in Moab. Yeah. <laughs> I worked for a, <laughs> yeah, a non profit company called Floor. They are now part of the National Ability Center. And have been guiding also in on with them and the company for the last year, oh, my last eight years, going this year is going to be my ninth year. Cool. And <laughs> so you have nine years of experience, you've been boating for a while, and I got really intrigued by your story when I saw it on our Instagram post, just asking about uh, a completely unrelated question. Um, but you had a pretty compelling story, and started telling me about um, a couple different things and one of those was this boulder story on the Marignon which I really want to get into um, <laughs> but before we get to that story um, you know I, I kind of want to hear more about your thoughts on paddling abroad with people you don't know and you know obviously you've you've been on the Marignon and you've been on a couple other rivers so what where have you where else have you paddled um, I did the Blue Nile in Ethiopia and did the White Nile in Uganda. Okay, cool. So you've been to Africa, you've been to South America. You wow, you're you get you get just got a couple more continents to go, but <laughs> before you get in there, so uh, I have technically only like I'll throw in Antarctica uh, as far as my continents to hit. But only rafting I've gone in three, or oh, sorry, uh, three countries and like three different continents. Cool, and. So my, my question, I guess, is, and I'm going to be talking about this with another one of our ambassadors, Mandela, um, it is about the idea of finding yourself when traveling. And personally, I think it's kind of a weird concept when people talk about it. Um, but I wanted to talk to you and get kind of your opinion about travel and, um, and, and so... Like when you're going abroad and you're paddling with people you're not super familiar with, what what's that like for you? Like, can you describe that experience? Like, uh, yeah, it's by adding and describe it honestly, it would be like almost terrifying and exciting at the same time. Uh, so even just like traveling internationally or traveling nationally, you always have this feeling in your gut, like what's it gonna look like? What, who am I gonna meet? Am I gonna be able to join this group? Am I gonna get along? Am I gonna be able to perform well in the water? So like when you meet up with people, you're like, now you're a pod and you have to be able to bring stuff to the table, just like you expect them from other people. I think for me, a little bit of my history is that I, did a trip in Peru like, pretty early in my guiding, and so I wasn't, I was like overconfident in my ability, but I wasn't sure as well like, how it was going to look meeting these other people that I read their profiles to do a little introductory on the emails and be like, these guys have way more experience than me, they can travel a lot more than me. It was like, ooh, they're bracky. but it's something, it's like when you quoted before, discovering yourself. I had a really big draw to go and see these places and I had a friend that luckily encouraged me to go to the Marinon and it was just his words in person I was like, you got it, you handle it. So I ended up going and learned a lot. So <laughs> how, the when did you go on the Like what was your experience at the point you decided to go on that trip? Uh, I was a second year guy. Okay, so you're a second-year guide, and you're going, 
Now, did you know any of these guys, or, or was this just some random thing that you got thrown? No, like, my friend went on a trip, I was like, uh, I don't know, like, I'm not sure three months prior and he told me about it and I was like, you should go, but I've done trips with him in the past on the Cataract Canyon, some end of the season trip down that. And so that time I worked two seasons for Explore and then I took a season off to work for a wilderness therapy company so I was planning to go for Peru. So in order to pay for it, I had to earn a little bit more cash. So I had no idea who anyone was and I was just talking people through email, mostly uh, Rocky Conto, the one who provided the trip and organized it for us. I was exchanging emails with him off and on, and <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing what, on that side. What, what is this, like, what's going through, okay, so you buy the ticket, <laughs> you, you get set up for this, what's going through your head, like, you're a second year guy, you, you know, you're traveling abroad, I mean, you're, like, that's a pretty big expedition trip, so... Like, what's going through your head through all of this? Well, I had some background of traveling before internationally, and I think that helped a little bit. Uh, I taught English a couple times. Like, I lived in China for, like, about roughly five months. And I uh, traveled my grandmother from Norway and just done these other trips. And so I was comfortable with the international aspect of it. Uh, the, as far as, like, the guiding, I, just, I think I was so hooked. And I was looking for something in my life. I went through a transition when I became a guy that like, dropped out of college and I like, broke up with my boyfriend at the time and I like moved four hours away from home. And so I was like looking for something. I was like kind of got on this high. And it was like, well, this is the next step. I can find this next adventure or an abroad. And this guy said I could do it. So obviously I could do it. <laughs> so, so I was like, what I was thinking? I was just writing it. <laughs> and I, I didn't think it through fully. <laughs> Okay, and how old were you at the time when you did this? Okay, I was like, I think, uh, like, 24. Okay, so you're 24, you're having, like, an early life crisis, it sounds like, and you <laughs> jump on this trip. Um, so that kind of leads me into the Boulder story. Now, you are telling me this on the phone earlier, so maybe you can kind of recap for everybody, like, this story about the Boulder <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. And I didn't really start thinking until I like arrived in Lima, and I was like, "Oh, this is the place." And then I was like, "Oh, like this is the place." Like, how far away is that, though? Like, like how far do you have to go to get from Lima? I think it might have been like two hours to get there. Okay. Like, so I was like, "Oh, this is the place." Okay, and do you speak Spanish? No. Okay. I brought I bought a dictionary though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep going, keep going. I I could I could be wrong about the distance. It was, like I'm thirty one now, so I'm trying to remember all the events and uh the the time that I was gonna fly in ended up being a conflict for when the everyone was gonna leave to go to the put in. And the put in is not like our river put in. It's like Somewhere uh, crossing over the Andes, be like the size of a river. <laughs> it's not like a Disney site. You can't like tell someone, take you there. And so I just meant like that was the point where I realized like I should have thought this out so much more. <laughs> and it's fine. I met up with everyone an hour before we were leaving, and so I was able to like greet them, get on the bus, drive up over the mountains, and then we put in. <laughs> um, Jeez. So, Eddie, you kind of just like grab onto the shoreline and then 
stuff down your bow and then you tie it off and it's still like kind of in the current, kind of a little bit of an edit. So there's like three of us or four of us that are on the river left side and then like three of them that went to the river right side because they were like, oh, there's no room for us. And right when we were scouting, we had one of the local guys, he was a kayaker, and he was like, okay, like, I'm going to show you guys the line, we're just going to set up safety below, so that's cool. And as we were watching him enter into this rapid, and this rapid's like loud, like, you can't really hear anything, and then all of a sudden we see him, he like, blows, like, this loud whistle, he doesn't have, like, a plastic muscle, like, it's straight through his fingers, this guy was, like, incredible, blows. Uh, with the and point, as he's dropping into this, like, like a flat four rapid, we look up and we see the guys on the other side of the river are just, you know, watching what we're watching, except for we see the like, house size boulder tumbling down towards them. And they had no idea, they couldn't hear it, because of the rapid we were scouting, we were, like, waving our arms, and they were just like, yeah, we'll be there in a second, they were ignoring us. And I thought for sure, like, day two of this, this is like, I'm going to witness some people die before I run any rapids. <laughs> and luckily, like, it came, and it stopped behind a bigger one. And, like, right when I saw it, I was like, hey, now we're going to do rock slides. And luckily, it didn't. It ended up just stopping. And after that, was the guys behind them saw the pot of dust. And you can literally see them across the river just shrug their shoulders. And then, like, walk back to their boat. It's, that's <laughs> funny. Like, I think that's what I realized. I was like, I may be way over my head right now. This is pretty wild. <laughs> so, um, well, like, what's going through your head at that point? Like, did the reality just hit you like a freight train? Like, you, you just, like, what did that feel like? Honestly, I think I blacked out the feeling. I think I was just in survival <laughs> mode. <laughs> I don't remember feeling anything. I remember like, Okay, yeah, they did that, that's good. And, uh, so you, you got all these guys that are really experienced boaters and they're, they're just like shrugging it off. Like, wh what did you think of that? Like, what, how did that, how did you feel when that well, happened? Well, those guys didn't even know we were looking at. Like, we, when we went to camp later, we told them, like, did you know there's like this guy got this boulder falling here? Like, no, we thought you guys were trying to call us over. And we were like, yeah, we'll get there. But they had, like, no idea what was happening above them, which was incredible for me to be like, oh. like, I couldn't hear this boulder, and then they couldn't hear this boulder, and that's how loud this rapid was. Because, you know. like, I've, rapid flies are loud. Like, I've heard several later on, and they're pretty loud. And, like, so, what... Uh, <laughs> It's funny because there's a lot of dumb river luck that happens to us all the time. Like we're always, you know, you always travel and all of a sudden like things go totally wrong and then they go right. And you're like, how did that happen? Like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I had like six different instances on this whole trip. The next one, I think is like day three or day four was probably the one I'll always remember. And it's the lesson of like how to shift your oars and keeping your space. It's <laughs> like when you're going through narrow channels. Uh, that one's probably the one that I, it's like pretty clear in my memories and those is uh, you get into this little narrow canyon so the walls are just like straight up. And uh, we, I think the group before us ended up scouting it. Uh, but our group was just going to run through it. And so there's, I just remember to shift your oars and so we had a lineup, and I was like fourth person in line, and we had a cataract going through first, and then uh, two more rafts, like 16 foot rafts. And the cataract was going in, and the second one keeps bumping it, and eventually the second caught a little bit of the wall, and then just like went sideways. And that mm -hmm. was like this like man made undercut. And <laughs> what happens like the cat like went out of sight like we have no idea what happens at the end of this canyon wall like it turns again like how this river does it keeps turning uh, sometimes you'd be scouting a rapid and you would only see half of it and so that boat cut and then the third guy like he I wasn't sure quite of his experience he thought that he had a lot of it and in his mind he thought that like, he could just bump the boat out from being wedged and I mean like it was wedged like this like, mm. it was not going to go anywhere and he ended up bumping it turning sideways 
flipping. And now it was like a guy in the water with two rounds upside like well, the weapon was upside down, but an upside down one. And you know there's a big round in at the end of this channel. That was the scene and I'm Oof. like I don't I was like, ah, uh, uh, and I can hear the guy that had the wet boat, he was on the wall and he was like, That's okay. <laughs> I see our leaders up in the water. I like just throw my arms away. I can't remember. Throw them. I just kind of like up to the you know, locked in. I run off the boat. I jump on his upside down. I grab him, pull him up, and then we climb. And at that point, the guys behind me, there's like three more boats, are like, okay, yeah, we're going to flip. And so they were able to like find a little side channel and climb effortlessly. Like, they're... But that was probably the one that was like, okay, this is definitely. Uh, like the part of the river I've never experienced. Like I had not like, flipped at that. You no, know, um, I have only flipped one time at that point. It was like a wide open area into a pool of water. Here we are. Like there's now like four or five flip boats in our channel with like a class four right after it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like losing gear. We had a yeah. We had some some of us holding on to parts of the boat on the thing while others. Like we had a couple of kayakers with us and they're like trying to reflip the boats and unwet them and each boat that came would be like, just jump in and go. They just need to be to get out of this channel. We're like, let's go find the cat, where did the cat go? And um, <laughs> so like we weren't sure we were when we were like one guy and he like it was a kayaker and he went with the boat and he ended up in like I don't have the oars and so he like tied a rope to the boat and then swam with the rope onto shore and then like grab the rope before the boat kept going downstream. I don't know how he did it, but I didn't, I wasn't there to see him. That's what he told me and actually like massive good sweater. Uh, my boat, when we were it, I was missing a blade and then like a spare oar. So I only had one oar and we were let go. It was me and a kayaker. So we ended up taking our helmets off and trying to like, you know, pad all the best we can with our helmets shore, which doesn't really work. Um, and then, like, every time we were hitting a hole, we were going, like, high side, kind of it. Eventually, uh, he swam to shore, and I threw the rope to him, so we were able to, like, swim to shore. And, like, Jeez. next then I see the two guys behind us, and they're, like, thinking, like, oh, we're going to flip in the hole. So they just stood on, like, their upside down boat, <laughs> ready to flip, like, lean you back. And then they saw, like, that big hole in the class for a rapid, and they were like, oh, no, that's too big. <laughs> so they started high sliding on top of that. And then Jeez. we got all of our solo gathering, but it was like <laughs> a mess. And on the map, it was said it was a class two. <laughs> You're like, oh my god, what's the class four look like if this is a class two? All right, that's when I was like, if that was a class two, what is a class two? <laughs> like, like, that was probably like the one I stand on my ground. Just like, okay, this is, I'm going to try to survive this. I don't know if I can really do this because this is insane what's happening. <laughs> So it's really fun to hear this story from like the perspective of an experienced boater. Um, you know, it sounds like a crazy trip, um, or, or things got crazy at times. But you said that this was that was only your second flip ever, and um, you know, uh, there's a question I want to uh, I want to get uh, to. Actually, it was my third flip. Actually, um, yeah, it was technically my third flip. I had two other ones. That I told you about earlier, or it was like one on Hell's Canyon, that was open pool, and then the second one, the second was the undercut one. So the undercut story I wanted to get to, and you know, yeah. it, 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 you know, there's this, um, there's an effect called the Kruger-Dunning effect, where, um, you know, the to a certain point, like as you're inexperienced, the your uh, I guess. Um, your confidence gets really, really high, like higher than even the most experienced person in a subject. And it, it's kind of a cool psychological effect. But um, in the rafting world, you know, there's a lot of ego. So I always call it second-itis. Um, it manifests in weird ways as like uh, second-year guides. And uh, just, just kind of walk me through like um, the Hell's Canyon trip. And because and, you had an interesting story about how is led up to it. So you guided a year, uh, a year in Moab, you said, and then you went on Hell's Canyon, and uh, I'm sorry, what was the other one, uh, Arkansas? Um, uh, yeah, so I was working out in Moab most of the season, uh, 
uh, but I did some private trips. I know I'm staying with a group of friends, and uh, the biggest rapid on the Grand Inn is like this one foot, like, whole, well, it's not a hole, but like ledge drop into two lateral waves. And if you don't drop right, you ride one of the foot, and you can slip and it can drag you to the uh, But generally, it's a pretty nice swim if you don't go deep. <laughs> like, go full right afterwards. And I would put in a paddle boat, or I like asked to use this paddle boat, and I hadn't learned to paddle dive yet. And so, my first few years, we were strictly rowing because we're working with people with different abilities, and so a lot of them can't physically do stuff, so we just row the whole time. So I'm in this boat, and I think I know I'm paddling and trying to figure out where the line is, and I just see like this like, smoke coming out of like a boat, so, uh, sorry, not smoke, but, uh, spray coming off of the wave and I ended up just being a little bit too far right and I rode up on this wave and I remember like watching my boat just like stand up and two people in front of me falling and I caught one of them uh, so we just <laughs> like just hit the water and we went up <laughs> it was a beautiful flip and we ended up like, I didn't go deep and so it's not that big. One of my dudes did go deep and he was able to save one of the water guns. <laughs> <And he came laughs> out so, that was like my first experience with Blip and everyone been on the river before and so it was really easy. Like everyone was calm and they got the boat and we really flipped it right away and it was like flat water. So it wasn't really that experience. It was like kind of like you had to most people when they're flipping it like looking for fun and so that was pretty cool. Um, and then meeting up with the same group of people we did a trip to, or some of the similar people had their so went up to do the Arkansas. And I, I can't remember which stretch it was, but it was not supposed to be a very difficult one. I think it was like a last three stretch. And again, like trying to paddle back at this time, like being on a bigger river, and like I've never been on anything more narrow than the Colorado and Bill Canyon. <laughs> so, uh, I was bumping into things and trying to figure it out and so eventually we're like we need to catch an eddy and like this commercial company go through. But when I did that, like I took all this tire thing and then I was like, oh, that's an eddy and I was like, you know, like a small boat and I tried to catch it and what it was is like there was a little pocket that was enough room for a kayak but not enough room for a raft and it was hovering right above an undercut. And I didn't know these things. I didn't, like, I knew what hydraulics were, and I knew what waves were, and eddies, and that was, like, the extent of my knowledge of rafting, um, and so, we went up, and then just all of a sudden, we were, like, starting to get drawn to this rock, and I was like, what's going on, we can't get away from it, and I was like, my friends are cursing at me, because they all just go back, <laughs> and it was probably the most, like, traumatizing experience at that time, because I had no idea what was physically happening to us. And the boat just, just like came up and just started slowly crawling. And I was just going, like, none of us were climbing on top, and the rest of the people were falling. And then all of a sudden, by myself, standing on top of the boat. And then I don't know where the transition went, but it went from, like, me standing on top of the boat right here to getting between the boat and the rock and holding on to the handle and just feeling the, <laughs> probably the water trying to rip. I was like, I'm just going to hold on. This <laughs> is like, not happening. I have no idea what's going on. And then I fell in the sled boat. And I was like, okay. And I took a breath. And right when I took a breath, and I fell it ripped me again. It was like, almost like the water was playing with me. How that felt, where I just felt relaxed. And all of a sudden, I was like, ripped out. And I didn't know where I was going. So I went dark. And I hit a few things along the way. And then I popped up on the other side. This was a pretty clean swim. And I see that the drafting company we were letting by were waiting for us <laughs> behind this rock. So they knew what we were going to do. Mm. And they had all of our crew, we had the two dogs, so they had all the dogs, they had everyone else, and then I see the boat just start going down the street. I was like, well, you know, in my head, being like, well, the captain always stays with their rock. So I'm just looking at the boat and thinking, like, well, this is going to be like El Canyon and the Davis. Kind of the water has to calm down at some point. And so I'm holding on, and I'm like, try to get up, but the water's equal, and I did not have the right clothing. 
And so I'm losing my strength eventually where every time the boat hits a rock, it spins and drags me under, and then I have to keep pulling myself a surface. And uh, one of the safety kayakers came and he's like trying to push the boat to shore. And I'm like you know, dog paddling, <laughs> holding on the boat. And we got it to shore. We got it stuck on the rock. And it was like behind the backyard. Guy and was like looking at us the whole thing from his backyard. <laughs> uh, I remember the guy ever being like, Can you stand up? And I'm laying, holding onto the boat, laying on my side, and I'm like, No, you cannot physically stand right now. And, and so he's like, Well, you have to be in a high couch. <laughs> and they're like, Yeah, we're going to high couch. So, how many, rapid, how many rapids in are you at this point? Not very far. I think we were near the beginning. I, I don't, I think we did one that was like said mandatory go left, and that was the first big rapid because it, it was dynamite at some point, they have a sign that says you need to go left, and then after that, I, I don't think we got very far, like, I remember that being very early in the day, So it's kind we were all just like, oh that sucks, and we're not going to see you in that it's going to be worse. <laughs> So it's kind of, you know, adventure sports are always kind of a, like a ego-driven thing. So, so it's like, tell me how you felt hiking out of it. Like, like what did that feel when you were just like, you climb oh. out? I felt horrible. <laughs> um, I felt embarrassed and I felt horrible because one of, the, one of the girls was with us who's starting to get into her boyfriend at the time was really into it and so that was kind of her experience and it was not the greatest experience and she really didn't like white water after that and that killed me to have that um, some of the people were like really understanding and like it's okay it's okay but I think I, I carried that guilt and part of the reason why I also wanted to go to Peru so soon after that was to prove that I can with this guy. I, I took the weight of that. I was like, oh, I traumatized the person. Yeah, he died on a trip that like, we don't know what would have happened. So, like, I don't know exactly what's going on. And, um, you know, it's just like creating that. Because I never had it. Like, when I was working for my commercial company for like Floor, we did the MOA daily. We had a class of scratch at best. And if we did any pattern painting against the door, we did low water. So, So you're. Everything else falls after that. I was like, okay, maybe not. <laughs> so you really like carry this with you, like, like, does this, does this, like, feeling of walking out of the Arkansas, like, does that, I, I mean, how does that affect you to this day? Like, do, do you feel like that's like a really formative moment in your like adventure sports career? Uh, yeah, I think uh, that uh, what I carry about is how I died. Risk I wanted to take and all these things. Like I think that trip, because 
Well, I didn't really say this before, but like, you know, during that time I was swimming. I was swimming for a long time with this raft in cold water. We dragged everything. But I had like a lot of time to be like, this is not fun. <laughs> I don't want to do this again. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, like that is what you were saying. It's okay. Like now, like if that were to happen, I've had like another undercut uh, or a couple more undercuts since then, and I have felt more like coming back to it. Like I mean, it's easier to come back from it. But without it, just set the tone on like mostly how I train myself as a rapper and how I train myself is like how well I do as a rapper. And that was like my drive. So, so doing personal challenges like actually wanting to travel and then wanting to now be a really good voter, like that is what set it for me to like go abroad. So I have this question that I've, that I'm really curious about with people, and it's it's about the finding yourself thing when you travel, right? Like, because as rafters, um, when we're on the river, we travel, right? Like, we're still traveling, whether it's you know traveling to some river five hours away or you know yeah. five thousand miles away. So, you know, people always talk about this. There's this idea in the social media and Instagram travel world of like, oh, go find yourself and and find yourself. Like, I, and, and you're laughing, but so, uh, but I'm just kind of curious, like, your thoughts on, are people really going to travel to find themselves, or is it more about building, like, mental and emotional fortitude? Like, what, you know, what does that even mean, like, finding yourself? Like, maybe you can comment on that. Well, I, I can't speak for, like, what a lot of people are sorry for it, but I feel like a general feeling is... When you are traveling, you're leaving that comfort zone, and your danger place is more of a unknown. And so, finding yourself is knowing how do you handle these situations. Like, what is it going to be like? And, like for me, it's like mine was like, well, there's heartache, or uh, one trip we lost like all this, but like most of our food, our kitchen is tilted. Like, how do you respond to those? Like, how do you respond to being with people for 28 days that like, you never met? You may not enjoy being around them. Uh, like, just finding yourself is based on what your personal challenge is and, like, what you want to get out of it. That's funny, like, I, I read... Like, I like to be funny. <laughs> like, I like to be very challenging and come back like, well, that was not super fun, but I'm glad it happened. <laughs> <laughs> it, that's funny because I, I, um, I, I'm just always curious about what makes people tick and, like, what gets people to do this and go into these situations that are really, really, like, adverse. And, it, you know, in your case, I, I am kind of curious, like, what you might say to um, younger female boaters who are just starting out their boating career when these opportunities present themselves or, or like, you know, or they get into a position where they end up being forced to walk out because I know that can be a really traumatizing experience for a boater. I, I had that happen to me last year. Uh, and, and so, you know, what are your thoughts? Like, um, if you were to say to another female boater, like, uh, in the early years, like, like. Um, you have to fail. You have to get those experiences and come back to them. I had a story like on the Grand Canyon. It was uh, this couple, and we all decided that it all, like, there's a couple of couples on it. And it was like, well, all the girls are going to rope trips. This is going to be us. And we're going to do it. We got a rally in Fort Carter. Uh, yeah, and like, it's crystal, and everyone is beautiful lines, and the stuff was high, and down, further down the river. Know, the confidence is still there, and then we decided that, like, well, let's have the women do upset. Or, sorry, not upset, it was, uh, with that rock in the middle, we got house rock, and then, uh, dude, I'm skipping on the name, it was one of the seven. It's all good, I've never been on the Grand Canyon, so, but uh, some people <laughs> recognize it, but go ahead. Oh my gosh, so, so it's like, it's a classic run, I don't know. Um, you know, I'm a bad rock. It's 
So, if you haven't been on it, Bedrock is where there's this rock island, and there are like kind of like three giant rocks, and the current is at a flight bed, and it creates this wave train all the way up to the rock. Now, when you enter, you enter, the wave train starts from the shoreline, and so you have to navigate between staying in the wave train and like leaving it before you get off this rock. So there's like this pillow. No, sorry, you can't see it. There's this pillow <laughs> right here. Uh, there's a right channel, left channel, and everyone tries to go right because the left channel has all these strong eddies, whirlpool, things in the area. That's where people flip, either flip to right and left. You can't go left. Uh, first, people have found it. I've seen videos, but I wouldn't be aligned. I would choose first. <laughs> and so you either can flip right at the point of that where all that water is going, or you can go left and end up changing if you're flipping or not. And so everyone's trying to go right. And we were all, we were, it's like really scary to watch. It's, the move itself is not difficult. It's just a rapid you have to time yourself at. And you have to be really uncomfortable being in a little bit of that wave train. And so you have to sit there and then know when to hold back because there's all these little deeper rocks all around. You have to tuck behind them at the right time. If you don't, you can smack it over or spin and then that can be go left and just look. And so at the point like I was using phone to like I talked to the lines, everyone else talked to the lines and I think it was only myself and one of the women and she was in a boat with her husband and one of their dear friends. And I I could see it in the boat and I could see it in her the anxiety started taking over. And you could see where she went to, started pulling back too early. Her oar hit a rock, popped out. She went over other ones to grab that, and then she goes back to the and have either one of those oars. And it somehow miraculously rode up on that pillow, and it was straight up, and then it flipped. It rode to the left side, and they just kind of like high sided their way through. They made it out, okay? So it was good that she made it out, but because I was losing that oar, and it was that her friend over and she was just like, I couldn't do it. I couldn't, I couldn't, I, that didn't be said, I couldn't do it. And, so, and like, I, it just hurt me, dude, just to see that, and so I'm just being like, you know, they made it out okay, like, no one was hurt, and stuff, but because of that one thing, and I think a lot of business owners will fit more closely than I've seen in a lot of male voters, like, I'm sure, I, I know some male voters that I've taken more personally too, but it's the fact that if you aren't correct on your time, that means that you aren't good enough. Hmm. So that happens to be like, you have to fail to understand what you feel like, and you have to fail to know where you can get better from. And I, that's one of the things that I try to, when I talk to anyone, is that it's okay to make mistakes, it's like what you do afterwards, and it's like what you are relating. It's like you'll pick up pieces from different rivers. And you'll start being like, this reminds me of this, or this reminds me of this one, and then you start figuring out how you want to read water. It's it's interesting because uh, you know obviously like I I can't speak to to women's experience on the river, um, being a male boater. Um, you know I, I feel like there are some ways which we we're all boaters and there's some ways in which uh, and, and this is always an interesting topic uh, to kind of get into is um, you know different ways in which men and women interact with uh, with boating and and how we you know how we kind of conceptualize of it and um do you think the the anxiety build up for uh, and obviously you can't speak for all female voters but um do you think the anxiety um it is a big factor um in that and and i should say maybe like how do you think that female voters um how, how do you think anxiety affects female voters in, in a large extent Uh, I think it's a huge thing. They already, you know, there's all these other things that you're looking out for in your daily life, and like, you know, it'll make more hardship for yourself and part of guiding. You know, like, some, some women, I feel like, have that confidence and they know that they're good and they get out there and they show off, and I'm like, yeah, I'm so 
awesome. And I think the other one, especially like when you don't have that underlying experience, it was like a, at least like for the first three years, I would say it's like it's hard to build up that confidence too because of, you're not going to have people to come out and be like, oh, you're good. Believe in yourself, you're good. And a lot of times you're going to be like, eh, you'll get there. Or be like, you're fine. And the anxiety behind the performing and knowing you're good that like you're strong enough and like that's the one thing I hear about women all the time is that especially with rowing, all the time people women who are not familiar with rowing will be like, I don't think I'm strong enough to do it. And it's like you don't have to be strong. Like, no one is stronger than the river. It's true. <laughs> you, you have to just like know where you're going. Guys always want to act yeah, like we're stronger than the river, but we're, we're not either. It's, it's true. <laughs> so, um, I, the reason yeah, I, I, I... I guess the reason I asked this question is because... Um, sorry, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Nessa, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, cool. Uh, I guess the reason I, I really asked this question and I'm curious about it is because... Um, you know, th this all started from a post I saw on Facebook about a guy asking how he can support his girlfriend and, and help her become a better boater. And, and I'm a big fan of compassion and understanding people from their perspective and their, their mindset. And, and I think that this is a very fundamental difference between uh, male boaters and female boaters. And... And, and one of the things, like, yeah. guys have this thing about bravado where we just, you know, we're just like, yeah, I'm so, I'm so good. And then, you know, our friends play into it and our, you know, our egos start getting wrapped up into it. Um, and and it, it's an interesting, like, way that men interact. You can actually inspire men to do things um, pretty easy through peer pressure, especially younger guys uh, on the river. Uh, you can, you know, hype them up and be like, yeah, 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 you got this, you got this. And then they're like, yeah, yeah, I got this, I got this. And I just wonder if that, um, you know, when male boaters are interacting with female boaters, you know, I just wonder um, how do you feel that other male boaters can help support the female boating community, especially in adverse times or times like your story on the Arkansas where you're walking out and you, you felt really embarrassed and things like that. Like, how... How can guys help support in, in that sense? Um, I think more than anything, so that was like personally helpful for me because when I'm feeling highly anxious or feeling like feelings of failure, like I cry and I think that um, that is your soul in this era where it's like we are saying it's okay to cry, but it's like hard to be able to cry, especially in front of other male boaters. And, I remember, like, this one time when I was in Ethiopia, but I have a lot of, like, frustration with the situation, but basically, where someone helped me, like, another fellow guy really helped me through it, is what this story's about, uh, was, like, the passion part, but we had a surge of water that came up as I was trying to pass by this rocket, so we did, like, kind of a flight raft, and we dumped half the people up, but I... I, I don't know how I did this, but essentially all this adrenaline took over and I like threw my body over the oars on the side of the boat. So like had that, so like the front end dumped out and I had the two swimmers in the water and we didn't know what was going on downstream, like right above another rapid. And we had other people playing safety, but I'm like stuck on this rock and I jumped in the water to another rock and trying to get them to come closer and ended up that they were too far out from me and I was worried about swimming out to them to swim in a rapid while with them the boat and we had this time because I ended up going into the boat and grabbing them but up until that point all I saw is like they were approaching this rapid and I was petrified like on this rock being like if I swim out to them I don't think they're going to get in the boat but I'm watching two people who like were caught back in the boat they were like um, while going downstream, and that was like a terrifying experience to watch, like helplessness from your side, where you take on the responsibility as a guy, and you're watching people go downstream, and 
made them be signed to the city. I think we had people that were ready for it, the doctors that really came in and helped. But I felt like a failure, and I remember just sitting away from the group. Like, I apologized for you guys, and they're like, oh, no, it's fine. And they're like, really cool about it. But I wasn't cool with it, and so I was sitting there with my thoughts and this anxiety about it, and like what I look like as a guy. I was teared up, and one of the like, one of the characters came to talk to me, and he put his arm around my shoulder and was like, "There was no reason for you to be in the water. Like, you can't put more swimmers in the water. You did for it. It's just like compassion for allowing me to cry and like, out, just reaffirming me like, either that you made the right choice or like the happens to you. So, I think coming." from other people that size is so important. So a lot of times people don't know how to interact with people around them. You know, they're just like, okay, well, then we'll figure out what we'll you talk later. And he and I didn't actually have much, like, kind of each other. We didn't really talk a lot. And I think that actually built a lot of rapport with us that I could talk to about other things. You know, just like so many other stories I could tell where you just feel like a failure and people just come in and just being like, oh, no, to stop and realize that water is more powerful and you learn from things. So, it's really hard to see the person that's receiving that but for me personally, I think that part of the community is really effective. So, when, I guess what I'm getting out of this, maybe the, the, the best piece of advice it sounds like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is kind of, you know, if you see someone suffering in, in, in these instances, it's, you know, try to make a human connection to them. And that, that would be the best. Yeah, if you want to, sorry, I'm going to story, it's not going to like, give a short answer to it. No, no, it's good. It's but uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm going to encourage, because there's so, like, we've talked about so much, there's so much pride when it goes on, and then there's so much fear of not being strong enough, or like, I'm sure we're like, not being good enough to trade these other people, and I think, uh, coming out, and just sitting with people, and checking in with them, is like a really good positive way to build it. Like, I know I tried pregnant with that woman before I told the story and I just tried to listen to her and hear her thoughts and I just feel like you have this and you can't come back from it. And then the part of the thing that just in general that what makes an outdoor community is being that raw and I think sometimes you, when you don't have that tightness it's hard to be raw with each other and so therefore we get withdrawn and we're like stuck in our own thoughts and then we are like, well, just whatever, I can't do it. Or we pass it on to someone else and like, you know, because I have a girlfriend and my boyfriend, I'm like more confident than I am. I'm like, well, you just take over, I can't do this anymore. I think pushing them be like, no, you got this, you have to come back from me. And that's one of the things that told me after I was on the career and I had this chippy, nasty twin. I'm like, oh, probably getting kicked out of this. And the parents on their trip, where it's just like, it was like, um, I just tell what the swim was, it would make more sense. Uh, there's like a giant repetitive light hole that at certain levels will keep you there. And we had a guy fall up uh, the top of the raft and he's a lot of little rocks. And he's like a 70 year old man that came rafting with us because he got bumped off of his wallaby. <laughs> so he came to the Kalia. But if you see the Kalia, it's pretty like bumpy and violent and too quick. Um, and so, we were trying to make this line where you're trying to avoid the hole at the bottom but all the water's pushing through because you just have to charge and you can't stop. And he fell at the top. And so, everyone stopped. And we're like, we have some fall out, we have some fall out. And I'm trying to be like, I know, he's paddling, you can't rest you know, he's paddling. And generally, swimmers at that point, they're just following the least resistance. And so, you know, they always get taken out in that area and we have people downstream. Uh, but we weren't going, and so we came, we stopped, we went to that side where he's over the blood hole, and flipped. And I, like, got the boat was surfing the hole, and I wanted to, it was like, the 70 year old man, who was completely fine, he had the best line out of all of us. <laughs> um, myself, and one of the kids that works for my company, and his two parents, and the kid that was working for us, like, he ended up, body surfing on the outside and grabbing the boat so he kept circulating and I was under the boat 
uh, popped up and I was like under the raft, trying to like pull myself from under to grab on the top and then I like, got into the actual hydraulic and was up in there for a little bit and then popped up under the raft and was surfing the same hole too. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> everybody's surfing. <laughs> and we had a turn mount. Everybody's ran up to my body up and turn mount and tell it that it was fine. But uh, my head was very much. And then again, I was like, oh my gosh, like, that was a huge win for me and my kid. And like, we were kind of just like sitting in the corner, like hugging each other, being like, my <laughs> girl's head. Uh, but like, the parents were like, each year have been through it now, so you have to walk around the next round. Talk about me, the guy, and, and there's that. Was like, we have this time to walk around. Um, but, you know, I was like, no, I can't walk around. But, and then, like, my group was like, no, she has to walk around. Like, there was an option for me to walk in. But even so, like, he had to, like, talk to me, like, I can't come back and take it, but you have to run it. You have to come back, come back to it. And like the next thing was like three class four play, class four or four plus like in a row you have to do and that was like the first one so we had two more to do and he's like you have to get back on the horse right now so don't let it like scare you we're we're working tomorrow too. <laughs> that uh, yeah. that encouragement is huge. Yeah, you need to get back on the horse right now. I think that is definitely something people get nervous in overwhelmed by it. Like it's okay to be overwhelmed. Like, a lot of and you have to get back. So, that was a really long way to answer that. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think it illustrates the point really well that, um, you know, that, that encouragement to get people back out there and, and getting people back into the sport is, is a critical element. And um, so I kind of want to switch gears. We, you know, we got really deep there for a second, so, uh, which is good. I appreciate you, uh, you know, all your honesty with that. Um, but I do want to chat real quick um, about something that you had said to me. Um, it was about um, that you said women don't need to get stronger. Uh, you just need to figure out your gear correctly. And so, you know. Yeah. Well, it's not so much like not getting stronger. Like women don't have to be a group strength. They don't have to be as strong as what we are like, I'm not as strong as the guys. Yeah. You do need to build up some of your rowing, which is like easy to build up even throw for a couple of days and you got spur muscles. But the biggest thing about it is the misconception is that you have to be super strong is that when you are just muscling things is that you're working against the river and at one point or another like that's where injuries happen, and that's when you lose control of your craft if you're always expecting yourself to just work through it. I had a woman who was part of one of the people that gave me tips through the time of learning to row, and we were doing like Paris Canyon. She worked for Floor. She was, said something that has always stuck with me. She's like, anyone can hit the hole, but can you skirt it? Like, can you play around it? Can you be like, next to it and then like dodge away at that second. And the uh, whole ass she thought about she was very adamant about when it was a big thing. She was just like you got a lot of people that try to use group strength and then you got finesse. And a lot of women tend to be more finesse because they understand that their bodies aren't going to be able just to force through things all the time. And I am a firm believer in that is like once you know what positive water you want to be on, like, and anticipate how your boat's going to react, like, how your paddle, like, how your paddle is going to react, and then, you know, you go into your gear at that point. Uh, one of the hard things was, when I was learning to row, is that I didn't know the importance of adjusting your seat, or, like, adjusting yours, like, especially yours. I worked with men over, over six feet, and so I was always constantly out right here, and I just thought this was normal, and I was, uh, I was always just going to have pain, pain, and I'm like, I'm not strong enough, so I'm always going to have pain in my shoulders. I'm always going to have pain in my wrist because I'm not strong enough. And it was in the time of like being a career over I got, uh, I was off the road and I always did the team prior. I got some extensions so I could make my arms a little bit longer so that I could adjust them more into my box. And all of a sudden I was like, 
now I feel like I have control and I can go anywhere on the river and not be concerned if I'm gonna run away from the wall or if I'm gonna like hit the wind in time. Uh, I think that's the thing that's like, uh, even if women know that they need to adjust it, I've talked to women like out, when I work out in California and they're just like, I want to learn to row, but like, it's always set up for the guys and then I don't want to take the time and like, pull everyone out to adjust the equipment. I was like, like the biggest of SUV is like, if you're a guy, you need to be able to provide people the experience by knowing you're being controlled above, but you have to adjust the boat to you. And just be like winging it, because otherwise you're not gonna do as well. And then that might affect the way the trip goes out with people. Like I had it where I was in ruin as well. Like my words were all over the place. And I threw myself out of the raft. <laughs> I just like make a move. I was so off balance, and I just like went straight out and I just of the and everything. <laughs> it's funny because that that. Um, so it's hard, like it's women. Really not- it's interesting because that actually plays in a lot to uh, what you were saying about confidence on the river and um, you know having control of your boat. It seems to like all feed in and mesh together with that. Would you would you say that's a, like an accurate yeah. statement for a lot of women? Yeah, uh, it absolutely is. And like, I think that's why I think for anyone. My partner, he's 6'5", and I'm 5'6", so the boat's always sick for me. And he's not much of a boater, so he's learning. And he's learning how I think, like, most of women or anyone that's, like, shorter has learned where it's, like, you're just, like, in this little spot. You're trying to make it work, and it's not quite working the way you want it to. <laughs> uh, it's, like, ah, it's just, like, being confident to be, like, no, I need time to fix this. It's a big changer in how you feel the boat react, like how your oars react, how your paddle reacts. And I, even paddle guy, I've had people tell me that you need to sit like really far back in the boat and my legs aren't long enough to feel secure, so I actually sit kind of uncomfortably close to the, the paddler in front of me. But I don't have issues. I feel like I can still see and I can still get my way around things and that's good for me. So like knowing what works for you and your body and setting it up that way. Right, it's an interesting way of, of thinking of it because if you start out the trip like on your terms, it, you know, you, you take some time to set up the boat and prepare everything, and then you start the trip and you're like, okay, I'm confident, I'm in control, like I'm feeling like the gear is all there. I, I feel like that gives you like a more positive uh, feedback cycle in your mind, uh, just setting the stage for the trip. I, I don't know. What do you think about that? It's funny, I, my, uh... Yeah, like, I, that's the first thing I would tell people is, like, about their equipment, like, get to know your equipment, because that changes the game. Hundred percent. I, I have a friend who likes to say, um, he's a ski instructor, and I've not skied with him for a lot of years. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, cool. 
So I have a ski instructor friend and uh, I've been skiing with him for a lot of years and he always likes to say it's not the car, it's the driver. Anybody should be able to ski any pair of skis. But, you know, if you're in a Formula One race and you're driving a minivan, it's like, you know, it's not as fun for you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it makes total sense. So I appreciate the insight, um, you know, for male boaters, especially when they're interacting with female boaters and, and uh, and especially if they're you know paddling with their their girlfriends or their wives and partners um that uh, you know there's some good insight that that i think you gave everybody on that with just to understand uh what other people are going through and also help people set up their gear for them especially if they're less experienced um that's a huge thing so well i have nothing to say about that analogy though but i i, I agree with so if you're looking at speed, speed would be the same as raft. Like mm -hmm. Anyone can grow any kind of raft. But what it really matters, I've also been a ski instructor in a, in a rental shop. Yeah. <laughs> I get talking about, um, it's the boots. Right? If you don't have the right boots, that will change completely on how you ski. If it's too big, too tight, too wide, like you will not do well. You can probably get down, but you will not have fun, and you probably will hurt yourself. You're gonna have That's blisters, yeah. With your equipment, like the raft, or whatever. So, like, if your paddle's too short, or if it's like really too long, or your oars are out of here, like that's kind of what you're to do. Yeah, it uh, it changes. Work, but you're not gonna have fun. Changes the whole experience. So, um, wow, that was a pretty quick hour. Uh, so, uh, it, is there anything that? you anything else that you'd want to convey to uh people especially you know given the context of like um male boaters working with female boaters or, or uh helping just, i mean maybe just in general like yeah. having compassion for newer boaters and, and things that you would say like um you would have liked to have seen because i i know you'd mentioned to me you're a self kind of self-taught boater so uh, you know what would you say yeah um so I would say like other things uh, would be also like if someone's learning, you know, like everyone has different styles of stick for them, like some people want to be faster, right? Like for me, like I kind of wanted to be told about what's happening and then I didn't want people to talk anymore. And it was really overwhelming for me to have a lot of people telling me what to do with the lines because then I stopped looking at what I was looking at and started trying to look for what they're doing and then that's when chaos happens. Yeah. So for anyone who's trying to learn this, like it's okay to tell people to be quiet. Like I was getting checked off on the upper collie and I requested to have, not to have a checkout guy because I knew he would talk the whole time. <laughs> and like, it would overwhelm me. Like he's an amazing daughter, but I would have been so distracted. You know, the already anxiety I had checking off on the upper collie. And so me and that was like, yeah okay to be like I need to have to figure this out on my own or it's like tell me beta now and tell me in the rapid um, other thing for women uh, I think okay, I made a list here um you know what one of the things that I think also helps a lot of my confidence is that I had a lot of wins and a lot of things happen my first couple of years guiding that it helped know like it helped me through the water it helped me understand the consequences of this is abstract mind it feels like doing swift water courses really help a lot like to your mind like what a trainer is an undercut and then be able to do it and then also just like challenge yourself to go swim in class three like get a boogie board or something and a tag can help to interview like people interview like class four stuff and i think building confidence is like trying to have fun with it as well as having some compassion that's involved in your community, find those people who go with you. But more than anything, it's like knowing what you need for yourself to be successful and being okay to have to pay for it. I think that's one of my biggest things. Like I had to fight for a lot of stuff and I had to be really loud and I had a lot of people not like me. But in the end, like I got super confident in what I do and I love it more now than I did in that second year when I was <laughs> traumatized through everything. And I was like... It's worth fighting for. Years, really high, but yeah, exactly. Because you're fighting to have that experience. And you can't call it experience without experiencing it. It's true.
true. And I mean, ultimately, it's all about fun. That's why we're out here, right? Like, push yourself, have fun, have a good time. Yeah. I think that's yeah. that's huge. Exactly. Well, the fun part, the fun part. <laughs> well, I appreciate all the advice and all the insight that you have from your years of boating. It's uh, it's been really great to talk to you, and. Um, so at this point, if you guys have any questions for Meso, uh, feel free to drop those in the comments below and love to hear more from you about that. And then um, they can, you can always uh, let's see, you're on Instagram, so um, I'll put up your Instagram and uh, you guys can communicate with her that way. If uh, any female boaters have any questions for her, you know, I encourage you to reach out. Obviously awesome person who has some really amazing experience from around the world. So. Um, I, you know, I can't thank you enough for coming on and, and talking to everybody. And um, so, again, thanks again, Massa, and um, to all of to everybody watching. We will see you guys next time.